In this video lesson, we'll discuss Andrew Jackson as president, his implementation of the spoil system, his dealing with the tariff of abominations, and other aspects of his administration. Andrew Jackson, nicknamed Old Hickory, was irritable uh, and basically this was a condition caused by tuberculosis and lead poisoning from two bullets that he carried in his body from near fatal duels. Uh, he grew up without parental constraints as well, so his upbringing had some shortcomings as a result. The youthful Carolinian shrewdly moved up west into Tennessee where fighting was prized above writing. And there, through native intelligence, force of personality, and powers of leadership, he became a judge and a member of Congress. He is the first president from the West, the first nominated at a formal convention of a party in 1832, and only the second without a college education. And Jackson was a very unique president. His university was adversity, and he had risen up from the masses, but he was not one of them. He was essentially a frontier aristocrat. He owned many slaves, cultivated a large area of land, and lived in one of the finest mansions in America, which is called the Hermitage, near Nashville, Tennessee. More Westerner than Easterner, more country gentleman than common clay, more courtly than rude, he was hard to fit into a neat category. His inauguration seemed to mobilize the ascendancy of the masses. Nobody's mingled with people who were notable at the White House, and for the first time, the White House was open to the multitudes of the common people. To conservatives, this seemed like the end of the world. King Mob reigned triumphantly as Jackson's vulgarity replaced Jack Jeffersonian simplicity. Faint-hearted traditionalists shuddered, drew their blinds, and recalled the French Revolution. Under Jackson, the spoil system, which is rewarding political supporters with public office, was introduced into the federal government on a large scale. Senator William Marcy's remark, to the victor belong the spoils of the enemy. Jackson defended the spoil system on democratic grounds, and the routine of office was to be simple enough for any upstanding American to learn quickly. Why encourage the development of an aristocratic, bureaucratic, office-holding class? He wanted the common people involved in government. It was better to bring in new blood, he argued. Each generation deserved its turn at the helm. Washington was due or a ha for a house cleaning, he felt. No party overturn had occurred since the defeat of the Federalists in 1800, and even that had not produced wholesale evictions or changes in the people who were involved in government. The question asked of each appointee were not, what can he do for the country, but what has he done for the party, or is he loyal to President Jackson? Scandal inevitably accompanied the new system, and men who had openly brought their posts by campaign contributions were appointed to high office. Samuel Stalwart, despite ample warnings of his untrustworthiness, untrust was awarded the lucrative post of collector of the customs of the Port of New York, and he was a person who was known to steal money. But despite the undeniable abuse, the spoil system was an important element of the emerging two-party order, cementing as it did loyalty to the party over competing claims based on economic class or geographic region. The touchy tariff issue had been one of John Quincy Adams' biggest headaches, and now Andrew Jackson felt his predecessor's pain. Tariffs protected American industry against competition from European manufactured goods, but they also drove up prices for all of Americans and incited retaliatory tariffs on American agricultural exports from countries abroad. The Middle States had long been supporters of protectionist tariffs, the wool and textile industries were booming, and forward-thinking Yankees came to believe that their future prosperity would flow from the factory rather than from the sea. In 1824, Congress had increased the general tariff significantly, but wool manufacturers bleated for still higher barriers. Jacksonites promoted a high-tariff bill, expecting to be defeated, which would give a black eye to President Adams. 
to their surprise, the tariff passed in 1828, and then Jackson received the tariff problem, which is going to be nicknamed the Tariff of Abominations. Southerners, who were heavy consumers of manufactured goods with little manufacturing industry of their own, were very hostile to the tariffs and were outraged by the Tariff of 1828, branding it the Black Tariff or the Tariff of Abominations. Why did the South react so angrily against the tariff? Because there was definitely a Northern perspective as well. Southerners believed that the Yankee tariff discriminated against them. The bustling Northeast was experiencing, experiencing a boom in manufacturing. The developing West was profit, profiting from its rising property values and the rising population. And the energetic Southwest was expanding into new cotton lands. But the Old South was falling on hard times, and the tariff was basically being used by the South as a scapegoat. Southerners sold their cotton and farm produce in a world market, unprotected by tariffs, but were forced to buy their manufactured goods in an American market, heavily protected by tariffs. And the protectionism protected Yankees and other middle state manufacturers. The farmers and the planters of the Old South felt that they were stuck because they did not have industry in the South. They were mostly agricultural. But a much deeper issue underlay the Southern outcry, in particular, growing anxiety about possible federal interference with the institution of slavery. The congressional debate on the Missouri Compromise had kindled those anxieties, and they were further fanned by an aborted slave rebellion in Charleston in 1822 led by a free black named Denmark Vesey. Abolitionism in America might similarly use the power of government in Washington to suppress slavery in the South, and the tariff was an issue to take a strong stand on principle against all federal encroachment on the issue of states' rights. South Carolinians took the lead in protesting against this tariff of abominations, and their legislation went so far as to publish in 1828 a pamphlet known as the Southern Carolina Exposition, which had been secretly written by John C. Calhoun, who was Andrew Jackson's vice president. The exposition denounced the recent tariff as unjust and unconstitutional. It bluntly and explicitly proposed that the states should nullify the tariff. Through Jackson's first term, the nullifiers, nullies as they were called, tried strenuously to muster the necessary two-thirds vote for nullification in the South Carolina legislature, but they were blocked by a determined majority of unionists scorned as submission men. Back in Washington, Congress tipped the balance by passing the new tariff of 1832. Although it pared away the worst, most worst abominations, it was still frankly protective and fell short of meeting Southern demands, and it had a disquieting air of permanence around it. South Carolina was n now nerved for drastic action. Nullifiers and unionists clashed in the head state of election in 1832. The state legislature then called for a special convention several weeks later, and they solemnly declared the existing tariff to be null and void in South Carolina. As a further act of defiance, the convention threatened to take South Carolina out of the Union completely if Washington attempted to collect the customs duties by force. So you can see here in this cartoon the difference in the feelings about nullification between John C. Calhoun, who was Andrew Jackson's um, vice president, and Andrew, oh, that's supposed to say Jackson, um, on the topic of nullification. Andrew Jackson was the wrong president to stare down, and although he was not a die-hard supporter of the tariff, he would not perfit, permit defiance or states threatening to leave the Union. So he privately threatened to invade the state of South Carolina and hang the nullifiers themselves. He dispatched naval and military reinforcements to the Palmetto State, which was quietly preparing a sizable army. The lines were drawn, and if civil war to be avoided, one side was going to have to surrender or both were going to have to compromise. Henry Clay, the compromiser of Kentucky, stepped forward, and although he supported the tariffs, he threw his influence behind a compromise bill that would gradually reduce the tariff of 1832 
by about 10% over a period of eight years. This compromise tariff finally squeezed through Congress, with most of the opposition naturally coming from the protectionist New England and middle states. Calhoun in the South favored the compromise, but at the same time Congress passed something called the Force Bill, known among Carolinians as the Bloody Bill, which authorized the president to sue the Army and Navy to collect federal tariff duties. South Carolinians welcomed this opportunity to extricate themselves, and no other southern states had sprung to their support. Moreover, unionist minority within South Carolina was gathering guns, organizing militia, and, and criticizing separation. So faced with the Civil War within, an invasion from without, South Carolina and the Columbia Convention met again and repealed the Ordinance of Nullification and nullified the Force Bill. Neither Jackson nor the Nullies won a clear-cut victory in 1833. Clay was the true hero, bringing about the compromise between South Carolina and the federal government. But this is going to be a situation that is going to come up again as the issue of states' rights continues to be disputed up to the Civil War time period.